Hey everyone, good evening, good morning, wherever you are in the world. Thanks for tuning in. My name is Glenn Blakeney. I'm the senior pastor of Harvest City Church in Vancouver, along with my wife, Lynn. Hey guys, I'm so glad that you've tuned in today. Um, if you're not a regular, if you're not part of the Harvest City Church family, why don't you just go ahead and drop a, a line and let us know where you're watching from in the world. Thank you. I know you're going to enjoy the uh, time together tonight. Our guest is Mark Brisebois. Mark is a fellow Canadian who lives in Alberta. He's involved in a ministry uh, called Watchman, and he's also a pastor in uh, the Edmonton area. He's going to be sharing tonight on the topic of seeking first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. I know you're going to really enjoy it, guys. What does it mean to seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness? Well, let me just throw this scripture up. This is the Passion Translation. It says, so above all, constantly chase after the realm of God's kingdom and the righteousness that proceeds from him. Then all these less important things will be given to you abundantly. Wow, what an amazing thing that if we seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, the Lord Jesus has promised that everything else in life will be provided for us. It doesn't matter whether it's relationships, finances, which really it's material needs is the context of, of the statement here in Matthew six. But regardless, whatever you have need of, Jesus has promised that he's gonna take care of it. If you will seek first his kingdom and his righteousness. So Mark, welcome to the broadcast tonight. Thank you for being with us. Um, we're so blessed to have you, and I've been wanting to get you on here for quite a while. <laughs> so, yeah, uh, it's really nice yeah. to connect. And, uh, I mean, of course, Vancouver is uh, my former hometown. I'd lived in the Surrey, and uh, well, actually, I've been at Harvest City many, 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 many times to pastor's meetings with the previous pastor. Of course, George Johnson, we had many citywide events there, and so you know and of course you live in uh in white rock so that that in itself brings me all kinds of memories so i wish i was there right now yeah okay yeah it's a beautiful place we're really enjoying it of course we've never lived in vancouver previously moved here in february and then a month later uh with the COVID 19 uh, pandemic everything was shut down so here we are and mm -hmm. uh, church reimagined a church out of the box so to speak it's not just the gathering course that was never our vision anyways that our vision is always to be more apostolic to raise up people to be out there and administering the gospel and i know that's your heart as well and yeah. Uh, yeah hey why don't you just tell us a little about a little bit about your journey in the lord you know how did you uh, get to where you are today in terms of uh, your calling and your ministry and and who you are in christ well, like everybody, you know, I I had I have a uh, a sort of journey, uh, ups and downs, all kinds of things. But the, the the one thing I love to talk about when it comes to my journey is the supernatural element uh, from before I got saved. In fact, as a child, I began to experience supernatural things. I didn't understand it, and uh, but you know, I experienced things of. Uh, in the spirit where demonic spirits were, were harassing me and attacking me, things like that. But God brought me into the kingdom so supernaturally. It was, it was amazing. So the fateful night, I remember actually it was, a, I was backslidden and uh, I, I, it's not that I didn't believe, but I didn't feel that I could be good enough. I didn't feel like I could fulfill what I felt was the moral requirement of God to be a Christian. And so, of course, struggled with shame and all kinds of things. And and uh, it's a long story how God spoke to that. But essentially, uh, in the summer of 1981, I believe I was 19 years old. Uh, or, yeah, I think it was 19. 1981, uh, my, my mother said to me, the Lord told me to stop praying for protection for you. Oh. And I thought, I thought, what? Doesn't sound like a Christian thing to do. And she said, yeah, no, the Lord told me that my prayers have been keeping you from the consequences of your sin. Wow. And she said, the Lord has told me to simply every day deliver you into his hand. And um, from that point there, 
my life began to take a radical turn. Literally, the Holy Spirit began to show up at every party I was at. People uh, out of the blue would begin to show me their brokenness. You know, I mean, I'd, I'd be at a party. Can you imagine 20 year olds out, out of the lake at a party, girls, music, having fun, everything. I mean, all I've got is guys coming up to me, telling me how broken they are and breaking down crying. Yeah. <laughs> and, and it was like, I'm, th I'm, I'm, I'm thinking, what is going on here? But it was the Lord. And he's saying to me, he's saying, Mark, nobody has anything out here. It's all a game. It's all a show. It's all a facade. And you've been playing that game so well. Everybody thinks that you've got something and you do have something, but you're not willing to give it. And so, you know, it was a sense of conviction. And it was almost like, you know, when, when uh, uh, Adam was in the garden and they had eaten of the tree and they were hiding from the Lord. And the Lord came along and said, Adam, where are you? And I felt like God was saying, Mark, what are you doing here? You know, that's, that was that was God's statement to Adam. Adam, what are you doing hiding here? What are you doing here? And that's what God was saying to me. Mark, what are you doing here? Well, it took a number of times, but I literally had uh, a manifestation of the glory of the Lord in a bar one night. I had been sitting there. And I've been thinking, I was I was very much interested in the social. I felt like an outcast all the time. I always felt like everybody else was experiencing something that I wasn't, and that I I was the world was against me, and that that I was missing out on something. So I'm trying to get what everybody else has. And uh, I'm sitting there in this bar one night and I start thinking about my 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 list. I had a list in high school. And if I had this and this and this and this, I would feel like it looks like everybody else feels like. And so I had that list. And as I'm sitting there, I start thinking about four four years earlier. And I'm thinking about my list. Really, what's happening is Holy Spirit is showing me that I, my list, reminding me. You remember that list you had? And then basically he says, look at that list now. You have every one of those things. All those things you thought would make your life complete, you have now. And still the emptiness, the void. The, the, now you have a new list. Now you have another set of aspirations that you're leaning into. If you get that, and if you get the next 10, and if you were at the pinnacle of the world, if you were in Hollywood and the world itself was at your fingertips, you still would not get the resolve that you know you're missing. And as I felt that, suddenly the glory of the Lord came from behind me. I felt like this this sharpness of a brightness piercing through the, and in, in my mind's eye, I saw an angel standing with a flame of fire. And I knew my mom and her friends were out there praying, Holy Spirit, get them. <laughs> and, but what happened is I turned to look. It was that vivid. It was that experiential. I turned to look and it was just a cinder block wall behind me. And, and when I turned, everybody on my side of the table turned at the same time. Wow. So whether they saw something, everybody felt something, we all turned. When I turned back, yeah. something changed. I couldn't run anymore. It, it, I was like Paul on the road to Damascus. I confronted, the Lord had confronted me, right. thrown, thrown me down the ground. I knew I, I, can't, I can't fight this. And then I realized how long I'd been running. Wow. How hard I'd been trying to get away. You know how it is in your life. You know, you're in these seasons. You don't even know you're in them. And then all of a sudden the Lord visits you and gives you a clarity about the season of your life because you've now come to a harvest time out of a season. And that's transformation. So that I've had a few of those in my life. That was the first one, um, you know, into the kingdom. But uh, so, you know, it's it sort of has been the the mantra of my life has been supernatural supernatural occasions that were watershed moments of transformation into the next thing wow. and so i lean very heavily on that in fact i don't consider myself to be strong by any means disciplined by any means i am a manifestation of grace so that's my story and i'm sticking to it yeah well that's awesome thank you
That's great. So, Mark, tell us about your ministry, Watchmen on the Wall. What is Watchmen on the Wall uh, about? What's your mission, your your focus? Well, you know, the scripture the Lord used when he called me, and, and this was, of course, a, a number of years ago. I'm trying to think. It was like 1989. I was teaching at a Bible school in Edmonton and uh, before I moved to Vancouver to teach at Christ for the Nations there. And I was I was teaching there and the Lord I was in a time I felt the transition. The Lord spoke to me. It's one of those near audible, internal audible things where the Lord spoke to me. Ezekiel 317, yeah. son of man, I've called you as a watchman for the house of Israel. But I knew it implicitly meant Canada and the nations. And he said, I want you, I, I, the, the word basically says, hear a word from my mouth and give them warning. And so I saw myself like these watchmen on the city. You know, they would watch to see what's coming to the city. It was either, you know, it, it could be a, an attacking army, could be a messenger, could be a supply, you know, something good, something threatening, whatever it is. But the watchmen declare to the city what it is that's coming. And watchmen is sort of a prophetic symbol for the, 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 the intercessory prophetic types. In fact, actually, when we started, when we called our wall, our ministry, Watchmen on the Wall, everybody thought, is that like Jehovah's Witness? Are you is that Watchtower or something? Yeah, right. No, no, it's a biblical theme and it's a prophetic theme. Now, today, you Google Watchmen on the Wall or Watchmen, there'll be hundreds of ministries by that name. But there was only other one other that I discovered by that name uh, at that time. There might have been a few others, but it wasn't that popular. Right. Watchmen for the Nations out of Vancouver. Uh, Bob Birch was was uh, the other one who had a similar. So when I moved to Vancouver, we connected. But uh, so that's how it started. Uh, I was teaching in a Bible school. I began itinerating, and uh, and on it went from there. Okay. So um, what it, you talked about the role of a watchman, the scriptural precedent in Ezekiel, and how does that apply to our contemporary? culture today our society like being a watchman what what is the responsibility of a watchman today well you know what i i i my type of teaching isn't the kind that would break that down precisely or mathematically or scientifically except except this that i believe you know when it says that that god god says i sought for a man to stand in the gap so watchmen i believe have an intercessory capacity and there's a prophetic capacity about particularly in my case, hearing the word of the Lord. What is God saying to his church? And, uh, and so that's where we began, and, and I began writing articles back then and, and sharing things and started getting invitations to churches and whatnot. But um, I would actually say that the ministry that we have now is more apostolic. I did a conference uh, back uh, in Thunder Bay with Bob Jones and Dennis Wiedrich, and Bob gave me a prophetic word. He said, uh, "He said, you know, you've been operating as, a, as an inspired priest, but the apostolic is coming along." And uh, and you know, so, and I think the he was intimating the final stage. At least that's my understanding now. So a lot of my heart now is is about equipping and building, uh, but there's always a prophetic teaching element to that because um, even my name Mark it, it actually intimates builder so so I love I love seeing you know part of what even maybe we'll talk to, about tonight I the kingdom of God can be accessed on purpose you know when when you get when you don't know anything the kingdom happens to you but it happens to you so that it can happen through you you know, that God is not wanting us to be ignorant. You know, I remember as in Bible school, the Lord spoke to me that scripture uh, said, I don't want you to be as the mule or, or the horse led around, you know, by yeah. a ring. You know, I, I want you to understand yeah. my ways. And so and so maybe there's people out there and I want to encourage you. The, the Lord's ways are beyond finding out. That means you can, through your intellect, discover them on your own. But he's wanting to give us spirit of revelation because he wants to give us an understanding. If we're going to run the company with him, that's what it means to be co-heirs, co-rulers, co-workers with him. It's, it's This kingdom is father and sons, and he's wanting the sons to take over uh, and run it with him. And so he's giving us an understanding. So, so I, man, I, I'm telling people, this is not about just being making it to heaven. It's about becoming equipped with a revelation. So that through eternity, we can we can manage the expanse of the kingdom of God 
forever and ever and ever. It's a great opportunity. Ground floor opportunity, everybody. Right. Absolutely. And, you know, I love one of my favorite scriptures is Matthew um, 24, verse verse 14, where it talks about the gospel, the kingdom preached as a witness to all the nations, and then the end will come. Yeah. And um, regardless of where we fit into that in terms of our contribution, you know, whether we're an apostolic person, a prophetic person, or apostle, prophet, whatever we are, you know, the bottom line is we're all in the kingdom. And when we talk about the kingdom, um, there's, there are many people today, you know, we've obviously come a long way. The church has come a long sure. way, you know, but we're, we're still in many places, so much emphasis on church and, um, and, and it's not about, um, coming to church as, but it's, it's really about becoming the church. But mm -hmm. then where does that, the church fit into the kingdom? You know, even though in many respects uh, throughout the world now, because of COVID-19, we've not been gathering at least face to face. You know, we're, we're still um, the people of God. We're still the church, the ecclesia. But what about kingdom? I mean, what, what is the difference really between kingdom, having a kingdom mindset and maybe the kind of the more conventional traditional church mindset what, what are some of the real differences and how does that fit into what the lord's saying today well there's probably a lot of distinctions to be made i i like to think of the church and the kingdom kind of like uh, school and training you know your the, the church is the community is the training place but where you prove your wares where you actually do the stuff the bulk of people is out there in the marketplace in the world right. and so you know the uh, as it says in ephesians 4 that the fivefold ministry is given for the perfecting of the saints for doing the work of the ministry and so the expanding of the kingdom the manifesting I, I, I hamper, I mean, I hammer this a lot at our church because I said, listen, we're here to worship and, and I love to worship, but worship is not meant to be an experience for you. Yeah. Worship can be an experience for you and there's nothing wrong. You know, if you're going to give glory to God, there's no, no chance you're not going to get something back. But ultimately worship is to give God an experience by giving him the means to manifest here on the earth. And so I actually I wrote an article uh, uh, entitled Worship Experiences. Are you giving them or having them? And, you know, a lot of times we go to church to have an experience. Well, you know, the reason why people get disgruntled and tired of church is because they stop having higher experiences. That's because what God wants you to do is start giving experiences. You know, Paul, uh, Jesus said, my food is to do the will. And so the milk is, is what you get from you know the ministry of others the food the solid food belongs to those who are fully mature is actually involved in participating in the kingdom bringing the kingdom to others in fact we just were I, I got a prayer meeting worship meeting going on right now and one of my leaders came up and said i've been studying when john the baptist came and he said the kingdom of god is coming and he said i've been studying the greek words in matthew 5 and essentially when jesus came he said, he said, uh, he talked about the kingdom, but he basically said, the language is this, I, I'm bringing the kingdom. This is it. Here it is. Yeah. And, uh, and so there's something, and, and that's, ah, man, I, I love this. Father, I thank you so much, God, for the new faith that you're giving. I just feel this, this thrust of faith that all the hearers will know that yeah. this kingdom that is coming to the earth, that there's absolutely nothing on the earth or in hell or above the earth or beneath the earth that can stop it. God has held in reserve so many levels of the manifestation of his glory. There's literally no weapon formed that can halt or hinder the pure manifestation of the kingdom of God. And so God is saying, I want you to seek the kingdom because it is your destiny to reveal the kingdom. And what Jesus did is everywhere he went, he revealed the kingdom. In fact, if you want to see a mystery, when he he said to, to this to to um, Thomas, I think it was no, not Thomas, Nathaniel, in John chapter one, he said he said from this time forward, 
said, you're going to see the heavens open and angels ascending and descending on the Son of Man. Right. That's, that's a quotation from Genesis 28. And Genesis 28 is actually the first mention of, of, the, of the house of God. You know, Jacob has that prophetic revelation, angels ascending and descending. He wakes up in the morning and he says, how awesome it is, is this place? Right. He says, this is two things. This is none other than the gate of heaven. So right. catch that, folks. The gate of heaven is on earth and the gate of heaven is connected to the house of God. He says, this is none other than the gate of heaven and, and the, the house of the Lord. So church, church is meant to be uh, the, the, uh, the, tra the threshold point where heaven touches the earth. It, it means it's the place where angels descend in order to be released to minister to the heirs of salvation. I mean, it's where the prophetic words are released. It says angels do the bidding of the word of the Lord. They hasten to fulfill his word. Well, one of the things that you see in Genesis 28 is, is the father speaks to, J to Jacob the promise that he gave to his father and his grandfather. And the promise is, hey, I'm going to give you an inheritance. So what happens in the, in the gate of, of heaven? What happens in the house of the Lord? God gives prophetic promises. And so the church is a place of launching. The church is a place where we learn the movements, what it feels like when the gate of heaven is opening. Uh, the, the, the church is where we learn to worship and interact with the presence of God. Not just so we can go back next week and interact with the presence of God, but so we can begin to do that everywhere we are, every day, uh, every hour of every day, if necessary. So that's uh, that's essentially that for now. But um, anyway, is that is that uh, how's that for? Yeah, that's awesome. They see. I think the the truth is that a lot of times we make this. Uh, dichotomy you know we make it binary where we we look at well there's kingdom and then there's church and it's kind of like well we've got people that well i like the church and then people well i'm i'm into the kingdom and and yeah. you know you just really helped us to see the connection the integration there because it's so important if the church meaning the ecclesia the people of god really who are gathered um not just to to have a great service a great experience but we come together just like in in the um, you know the Septuagint, which is the Greek translation of the Old Testament, uses the word ekklesia, um, which of course is the word that is translated uh, typically church in the New Testament. Um, for when God's people would come together as the Lord called them to convene, and then always there was a sense of instruction that God gave to them, and then there was an act of obedience, whether it was to break camp, to move forward or whatever it is. And really that's what it means to be the church today is that we gather, we hear from God, but then we we move forward with our marching orders, so to speak. And, and I really love what you referred to in Genesis 28 about um, how Jacob had that encounter there in, in Bethel. And he talked about not only Bethel, meaning the house of God, but this is the gate of heaven. And yep. um, what I understand from that in, is that as Jesus told us to pray, what we call the Lord's prayer in actuality was his instruction to us to pray that his kingdom would come and his will would be done on earth as it is in heaven. So we have, uh, well, Jesus told Peter, right? I give you the keys to the kingdom to, to loose or to unlock, you know, and, and to close or to, or to uh, lock certain things. So, I think that we have this great responsibility um, and we have great power and, and authority. Yeah. You know, there's a, there's such a power there in that, in that idea. Not only that, if you go to actually Matthew where, um, you know, Jesus said, who do men say that they am? Mm -hmm. and Peter, of course, has that moment, that epiphany. Yeah. Uh, and he says, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. Right. That, and, and Jesus right away, he says, listen, that, that's not just information. That's not just mental deduction. You just, you haven't assembled the facts and come to a conclusion. He says, you, that's revelation. And Jesus could say that with authority because everything he did and said, everything I, I only say when I hear the father say. So everything I'm doing up to this point, I'm receiving in a ministry. I'm receiving in a ministry. So he was excited because he detected 
But the same anointing, the same power, the same dynamic that was at work in him was for the first time at work in his disciples. So he said, this is it, Peter. The thing that I've been doing, you just did. You received something from the Father and released it into the realm of the earth. And, and this is the introduction. He says, he says, this is the kingdom that, that will, the gates of hell will not prevail against, which is very interesting because what we're supposed to be doing is manifesting on earth, Genesis 28, which is the gate of heaven. And so I actually have this teaching where I talk about the battle between the kingdom of light and the kingdom of darkness is all about manifestation. Who can open their gates? Because the nature of the kingdom, as you remember Elijah with the confrontation with the Baal prophets, when the gate of heaven opened, the gate of hell closed. You know, the Baal prophets really couldn't do anything. They couldn't compete with this. And that's what God wants us to be. That's what the church is supposed to be in every community. It's not supposed to be a sentimental place of ritual and liturgy. It's supposed to be a living manifestation of God on earth. Angels ascending and descending. The prophetic destiny of people being declared in that place. And if we do that, the gates of hell will not prevail against that because they won't be able to operate. The problem we have today is people have this sentimental view of what this assembly, this community is supposed to be about. And so worship in spirit and truth is not taking place. The heaven is not manifesting. But imagine this. What if, what if, what if the only reason there was sin in our city is because nobody was opening the gates of heaven? What if the destiny of the people assembly was not there just to lick their wounds and comfort each other and be with friends and sing kumbaya songs that were their favorites? They're, what if it was about allowing an atmosphere that surrounds the throne of God right now begin to fall like a fog in the earth. And as it gains thickness and weight, it actually begins to fill that room. And when the room cannot contain it anymore, it begins to flow out the doors, like in Ezekiel's vision of that, of that river that you know flowed out the eastern gate. That is the church of Jesus Christ on the earth. And that I believe that's what's coming. Yeah. In fact, I, I wrote an article to, tomorrow. Uh, it's coming out tomorrow morning. And it, the message is this. God is retooling the church. And the heart of it is this. Uh, I was, uh, is that all right if I share this? Yeah, yeah. You're yeah. a guest. This is, I, I, this is your I, time. This is about we you. In, we were in a prayer meeting last week. And uh, and I, I began to, I don't know why, but we were praying. And I, there were some things unfolding. And I began to see. World War II, the scenario around World War II. And I saw the United States, and I saw the United States' reluctance to enter the war. Of course, the reasons were valid. You know, the World War I was barely over. There was amazing industry growth development. I mean, there were domestic breakthroughs where people were getting uh, luxuries like, you know, indoor plumbing, running water, um, electricity. They were getting... Uh, washing machines and things like this, you know, domestic life was getting uh, to be easy and wonderful and so much better. It was a, a thrilling time to get your house and your white picket fence and all the rest of that. All of a sudden, there begins to be this trouble in, in Europe again. Well, America would, had no appetite for another war. And so they resisted, of course, until that fateful day when Pearl Harbor was attacked. But what happened then is a prophetic sign for what I believe is supposed to happen. We are faced with a church that has largely domestic concerns. We have a church that's really there. Everybody's more concerned. They're using, we're using our faith to get a new car. We're using our that's faith right. to get a parking spot at Safeway. We're using our faith to, you know, to take care of our little boo-boos and to overcome, you know, mild aggravations in relationships. But that's not the ultimate purpose of our faith. Our faith is meant to wield and release the kingdoms, uh, the kingdom of God and the weapons that are mighty through pulling down into the strongholds of, of darkness. So what I saw is this amazing transition, this amazing transition where the United States went from a nation that was reluctant, that did not want to go to war 
to a nation that once they were pushed into the war, they begin to retool their factories and their production facilities and things that were used to make lawn chairs and widgets and, and this and the rest of the things for our creature comforts, things that made us feel good about our environment. We are settling our small world around us, but God called the United States to begin to care about the nations of the earth in a brand new way. Well, what happened is the industrial heartland of America shifted. It was retooled from domestic materials and products to military materials and products. And what I saw was this. I saw a tremendous shift that there's coming a manifestation of the significance, the importance, the opportunity that is before us for the kingdom of God. And churches that previously were given to just having a nice time to have a you, me, and, and us and our favorite little songs and our favorite little get-togethers and, you know, don't don't bother us, don't wreck our little assemblies, it's going to change. It's going to get a new vision. It's going to turn its focus on the powers of darkness and the armies of hell, and it's going to take the full strength, the capacity that is latent in the church right now. I, I, I tell you, I saw it. I saw powerful. the might of the body of Christ suddenly coming into a fullness and rising up. And it's like the enemy uh, is going to be sorry that he awakened us in the same way the enemies of uh, the allies were sorry they awakened the United States. I mean, it was the, the industrial power that fueled that battle. Well, there's, a, there's a resource of faith within the people of God, within the heritage of the saints. And largely, a lot of those people their, their faith is being wasted on temporary measures, but that's about to change. I believe God is going to enlist, conscript those talents, and use them for a mighty outpouring of the Holy Spirit. Yeah, yeah. Absolutely. Absolutely. That powerful, um, you know, revelation you had. Or was that an actual dream or a vision or it's just something? No. That kind of it, it just. I, I just I just kind of see things. I'm I'm in prayer. I'm praying in the spirit, and all yeah. of a sudden, boom! It's like a word of knowledge. It just yeah. It's just, it's there right in front of me, this picture. And of course, as I meditate on it, it, just what it means or what it's the implications of it, it just begins to roll out in front of me. Actually, that's how most of my revelation comes. That's how I, out of prayer and worship, that's how I write up my articles. That's, you know, I'm not, I'm not the type, I haven't had an open vision ever. I've never been taken up to heaven. You know, I've experienced heaven. I, I know what it feels like when I'm in the spirit. Yeah. I, know, I know what it feels like when I've entered the courts, courts of heaven. I know what it feels like when I when the books are open and that governmental atmosphere of decrees are about to be released. You know, all of those nuances, but I've never seen it. And, yeah. you know, I'm, I'm asking the Lord. I'd love to, you know, have, a you know, some, some more dramatic uh, experiences. But uh, as yet, it's fairly intuitive. Yeah. No, no, that's good. That's awesome. That's a great um, picture. And it actually is is really what the church is supposed to be doing anyway. You know, I, I was thinking as you were talking about Isaiah 60, arise, shine for your light is coming. You know, the glory of the Lord is risen upon you. And then verse two is, for behold, darkness covers the earth and deep darkness, the people. And, you know, the whole point there is these two um, kingdoms that are in conflict yeah. And ultimately, it's the glory of the Lord is we will arise and we will shine and manifest that glory. That's when the darkness is going to be dispelled and people are going to be set free. And, you know, you, when you when you drive into a city um, or, you know, you fly into a city, whatever it may be, there are certain cities where you can just feel the oppression. The spiritual darkness is just so, so gross and pronounced. And, you know, it's interesting. There are other places where you go to conversely, where you just feel the presence of God. There's a few places like that in, mm -hmm. in the earth today. And, you know, I've, I've traveled uh, to many places just like you do or have uh, not doing much traveling right yeah. now. He's nice. but, <laughs> and, and, you know, there's certain places that you go to and uh, it's just amazing. And, and how, um, the response that is there. But I will say this, um, we, we often look for the place, the fertile ground, so to speak. We look for the place that has, quote unquote, the open heaven. Yeah. And yet the mission of the church is to go into the darkness, to arise, shine. And, and 
you know, allow the glory of God to be manifested. And I think when we when we get that right, you know, I mean, I remember this this whole um, false dichotomy, the secular and yeah. the sacred, you know, and and uh, I want to do full time ministry. I don't want to be working and and that mindset. And and there's a lot of people that that I talk to that are still like, oh, I can't wait until the Lord puts me in full time ministry. And Right. And, but the point is, we have a responsibility to bring the kingdom into every sphere, into every realm of society and to change that, to change, yeah. you know, the, the, the culture, uh, not only the, the culture of the people, but I mean, the spiritual atmosphere, I guess, is a better way to put it and to change that. And so, Mark, when we talk about seeking first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, Matthew six thirty three and all these things will be added. Um, in in terms of you know I, this is the way I, I think. Like for every problem there is in the world, whether it's a personal challenge we face or it's you know a struggle a nation is having, but for every problem God has a promise, a right. promise that will overcome that. But I often say to people, but for every promise that the Lord offers us and, and gives us in scripture, for example, or, or prophetically, there's a process, you know, for example, in Matthew six thirty three, it said, the promise is all these things will be added to you. Yep. The process is seek first the kingdom and his righteousness. Mm -hmm. And a lot of times we have Christians that, that are just claiming the promise. Well, God's going to take care of all my needs. And like you said, you know, we want to, we we're our faith. We have faith for a new car or whatever, a comfortable lifestyle, rather than to advance the kingdom. Yeah. And and so let's just unpack that a little bit for us. And what does that mean to seek first the kingdom of God and His righteousness? Uh, well, yeah. There's there's so many things I could say about that. But let me uh, let me let me read. Uh, I shared uh, last week on this this issue, and there's a quote from a movie that. Um, that is is profound. I'm going to substitute one word, and I'm going to throw in there the world. Because when we are bringing the kingdom, when we are called to seek the kingdom, what we're trying to do okay. is we're trying to discover the system that is that emerges from the person of God. Now, the kingdom of God is is not a system that's independent from God. It actually flows from the essence of who He is. I mean, it's like love, love, God is love. So God himself defines what love is. There's no other interpretation of love. Love is God, God is love. And so likewise, the kingdom of heaven, the kingdom of God is a system that's rooted in the nature of God. And so when we're saying, when he says, seek you first the kingdom of God, he's saying, listen, incline your ear, for this system that is going to overtake the earth. Conversely, what John says is that in the world, the world, there's a system, and all that's in the world is the, 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 the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. So really, there are two separate systems, and one is going to win. One is going to overtake the other. Yes. So let me read this quote, and you may know the movie this comes from, but I'm going to switch, swap out this one word. It says, the world is a system. That system is our enemy. When you look around, what do you see? You see businessmen, teachers, lawyers, carpenters, the very minds of the people we are trying to save. But until we do, these people are still a part of that system, and that makes them our enemy. Most of these people are not ready to be unplugged. Most of these people are not ready to be saved. And many of them are so inured, so hopelessly dependent on the system that they will fight to protect it. If you're not one of us, you're one of them. Anyone who hasn't been unplugged is potentially an agent. Inside the system, they are everyone and they are no one. And so that is actual, a word for word quote, except for the word uh, world, which okay. is the word matrix. From the, from the, I don't know if you've seen that movie, but, but there's a system, the kingdom of heaven, is a system that emerges from who God is. And implicit 
to knowing who God is are all the rules of how this system works. That was a beautiful thing about David. You know, when David was living in an era where supposedly he was living under a, a less refined set of the rules of the kingdom, sort of elementary outskirt ideas, right. but he didn't. He did things that seemed to be reserved, like unlawful, literally unlawful. Why? Because his worship brought him into a place where he began to really discover the nature of God. And as he discovered the nature of God, he began to find the, the guidelines, the precepts, and the truths that, that were implicit uh, or native to this system called the kingdom of heaven. And so he began to work those things. He began to operate on a level that nobody else, none of his peers, none of his contemporaries did. And of course, there's, there's key, other key people. But basically, that system that has been hid from our eyes is making its way from the invisible realm to the visible realm by means of people like David who have, are leaning in to discover the kingdom, who are given to seek the kingdom. Now, it's very interesting. I love this verse because way back when I was a young Christian, I mean, uh, you know, I really identified with the previous verses because the previous verses, as you said, is all the context is all about material concerns because the system of the world is such how it traps you into its values is through lack. And so, and so the, you know, the siphon that brings you down and squeezes you into the mold of this world are the cares of this world. And so as, as the people are met, are articulating their yeah. needs, Jesus is saying, actually, this is the very thing that keeps you locked into this system. Right. But right. there's another system. If you would begin to seek it, if right. you would begin right. to discover it, that it will free you from all of the orientations that you have around a materialistic, limited supply world that you're in. Right. And, and, you know, everything he started to talk about after, after that is connected to this other kingdom. There is endless supply in this other kingdom. So many things we talk about with that. But one of my favorite offshoots of this is the second part of that phrase. He says, but seek you first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, the righteousness of God. Yeah, yeah. The kingdom of God, the righteousness of God. These are two almost key pillars of truth that when they are in our life, they ensure that we that we tow that walk that line yeah, of the yeah. kingdom of heaven and uh, the righteousness of God. Uh, you know, I don't have that much time to talk about it. I could talk about it forever, but it, it says in Romans that um, Paul says, I'm, I'm not ashamed of the gospel. Right, I'm not ashamed right. of the gospel for it is the power of God unto salvation. It doesn't say it has the power of God. It says yeah, it yeah. is the power of God inside the righteousness of God is the essential data, information, seed of life that will, that will impart the beginnings of the kingdom of heaven into you. Because wow. he, says, he says the gospel reveals the righteousness of God. And so he's saying, he's saying here in Romans, Romans 6.33, seek the manifestation of the kingdom, what the evolving you know, emerging, growing, you know, the, the, the kingdom of God is something that expands, right? It's like the river that comes out of the Eastern gate. It's deeper and wider the further it gets. You know, it's contrary. It runs contrary to the natural confinements of physical laws. You know, you, in physical laws, you start with, with uh, four loaves and you, you finish with less. Right, in the right. kingdom of heaven, you start with seven loaves and you end up with baskets full, 12 baskets full fish and you know that, that kind of thing so you have these prophetic pictures but they're 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 rooted in a reality but the righteousness of god does something converts the soul of man it it is it is you know i uh, i want to say this and i without sharing my whole testimony again but when i got saved i got saved uh out of a realization that i was not good you know one of the essential elements of the gospel is 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 it's communicating this there's none good no not one as you know uh glenn 
the the Pharisees of Jesus' day were absolutely astounded. They were enraged by that idea because they largely sent, spent all of their time measuring themselves for their goodness because they had a need, a deep need for affirmation. They had a deep need to escalate the ladder of self-importance through doing what they thought was good. And so when Jesus said to them, your righteousness in no way exceeds the righteousness of anyone. In fact, he said, listen, those guys that to that tower fell on and those guys that, that died over here, these violent deaths, you're, you're pretty sure they died that way because they were worse and you didn't die that way because you were better. Let me tell you, right. unless right. your righteousness exceeds uh, uh, you, 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 what it is right now, you're gonna, your fate is exactly the same. You are no better than these people. Well, that was astounding. I think in, in some ways in our culture, we're in that same place. I hear that tone. It's like, how dare you tell me that I'm not good? How dare you tell me that I, you know, uh, and that I'm not loving, I'm not this, I'm not that. Well, I'm telling you, we better not, we never better not be ashamed of the gospel because it is the only hope for the nations to be saved because it reveals the righteousness of God. Anyway, I love that theme, love to talk about it a lot because when I got saved, that's the thing that God confronted. And I, here's the thing, I was a bad guy. I was an adulterer. I was a fornicator. I was a drug addict. I was a brawler. I hated people. I was I was immoral. I was addicted. I, you know, I was everything. But if you asked me, deep down, I was a good guy, yeah. because we we create our own little code as to what's good. Even the mafia has its own code, code of what's a good guy, right? You know, every culture, every subset, every subculture of every culture has a, a, a mantra that defines them as better than others. And that one thing that they hold on to is their righteousness. Right. And so God is saying, listen, I want to I want to supplant you right. from that system that you're in because the righteousness that you feel you get through that system is what roots you in that system. Mm -hmm. So if you find the righteousness that root that can root you in my system, that's your beginning. So seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. The righteousness, the manifestation, yeah. the revelation of the righteousness of God is the seedbed of being rooted in the kingdom of heaven, in the kingdom of God. Without that, if you maintain an alternate form of righteousness, which Paul dispossessed himself of thoroughly, he said, I, you know, everything I've thought about before, it's yeah. it's dung. It's it's worse than dung, it's nothing. And, and because this was the, the requirement for beginning to be anchored in the kingdom of heaven and beginning to reveal the kingdom of heaven on earth. Powerful truth there, in that little scripture in Matthew 6.33. Yeah, it, and it, it's powerful because, as you said, when you read that, um, that verse in its um, literary context, Matthew 6, when Jesus is talking about what it means to, to trust God. Mm -hmm. And yeah. of course, there's always that that whole thing about trusting God has to do with seeking, and and uh, as you said, the kingdom and His righteousness. But the the whole idea of seeking that's a very strong word in the Greek. It means to pursue, and it's actually used one time where of physically laying hold of someone, seeking someone by force. And of course, we know that. The kingdom of God forcefully advances, but the violent take it by force. So we have to lay hold of it. So, you know, as as the Passion Translation talks about how it's pursuing, it's not like seeking. It's just not casually looking for something, you know, like, oh, hopefully I'll find this. There, There's a pursuit here. There's, yeah. there's uh, you know, something that we're to do. And, of course, it's not just uh, something we do on occasion. It's, it's a, a lifelong quest. Um, to really yeah. get a hold of the kingdom, to to understand the kingdom and God's way of righteousness, and part of the reason why that's so important is because um, it's humbling. It's when you are seeking for something, when you are you are you, you demonstrate your need. You are now the recipient. In in terms of the power struggle of this dichotomy between you and God, you are the lower, the, and that's what it requires. 
And what God is saying, kind of like uh, how he values humility, you have to aggressively pursue this with all your heart. If you are not fully committed to being subservient in this relationship, you can't have this relationship. This relationship is not for you. And so if if uh, the idea of, like, kind of, this is why I love David, right? He humbles himself in worship, and he says to his wife when she's critical of him, I will make myself even more undignified than this. Uh, this is what God is after. When you diligently seek for something, when you plead, when you seek, you know, if you go to James chapter 3, when it talks about what it takes to escape the love of the world. He says, weep, mourn, and lament. So there's a, an aggressive laying hold of something which the proud can't do. They have to be detached. They have to be dignified. They have to be, ah, I don't really want this. If I show too much eagerness, that puts all the power in yeah. your court. And that's the that's the power balance that needs to be shifted and is shifted when we are when we cross the threshold of that biblical seeking. That's a that's yeah. a real key thing. Right. And like Hebrews eleven six says that um, if we have true faith, we believe that he is and that he's a rewarder of those that diligently seek him. Yeah. And, and again, it's the same, really the same, the same Greek term. And the idea is craving, demanding when we're seeking, we're craving, we're demanding, you know, and in yeah. Hebrews 4, 16, let us boldly approach his throne of grace yeah. you know, with all the ideas, without spokenness, with, with confidence. But, and, and it's not just like, yeah, I know God's going to help me, but it's like, no, I'm going there. I'm getting it. I'm getting yeah. what God has promised me, which, of course, he said that we may obtain mercy and grace to help us in our time of need. And, and so, yeah, it's an amazing thing when we think about seeking um, the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And then out of that place where we understand what it means to live in the kingdom, this is the, the way I, I understand kingdom. First of all, we know Jesus said in John 3 that unless we're born again, we cannot see the kingdom. The word see, um, yeah, we can see things through the spirit. We can see it, but it also means experience, right? And Colossians has the uh, says that when we came to the Lord, when we put our faith in him, we were translated out of the kingdom of darkness. We're yeah. brought into the kingdom of his dear son, of, its, you know, of the son of God. So there's a move geographically, so to speak, where we go into a new kingdom, the kingdom of God. But while we're in that kingdom, we have to learn how to live in that kingdom and that by seeking the kingdom, learning how to be submitted to the king's dominion under yeah. his authority. And, and I really love the fact that God shows us, and again, the, the quintessential example in Luke 7 where, where the... Um, Centurion says, hey, Jesus, I, I get this. You're, you know, you're a man. You, you've got authority to say the word. I, you don't even have to sh show up here. Just speak yeah. the word. You're a man who has great authority. And he said, and I get this because I'm a man who has authority, but I'm also under authority. Right. And, and when we recognize um, the need to be submitted to God, you know, and it, like James, submit yourselves to God, resist the devil and he will flee. So this whole thing of trying to fight, trying to obtain the promises of God, you know, pursuing the blessings of God, but doing it without being completely submitted and surrendered to God, it just didn't work. It's no, just not his no. way. Right? I mean, Matthew 6, where he actually says Jesus is talking about um, seeking after the things of the world, meaning the material things and so on. And, of course, we could say promotion. There's so many different things. But Jesus yeah. said the the pagans, the heathens, seek after that stuff. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know the um, uh, this this ha really has its application. I'm I'm really big on worship. I'm a worshiper. Uh, big part of our DNA here in our ministry and in the church and what I do when I travel is yeah. around worship because to me, uh, the skills acquired in worshiping God uh, creates that juxtaposition. Uh, that enables the kingdom of God to flow to you. And so so to me, worshiping your God, God it's kind of like God, loving God. It says in the Old Testament, it says, you know, thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy strength. You know, so you got to strength, your heart, your soul, your mind. And, and that requires uh, a pouring out of oneself. That requires, you know, uh, so, so um, 
you know, I, I tell people, this is not entered into lightly or, you know, you, we're not on a Sunday stroll here. You know, um, we, we are, this is the greatest treasure for all of a sudden, you know, thousand dollar bills, a hundred of them fell in this room. Yeah. You know, what kind of eagerness would you demonstrate yeah. <laughs> in the pursuit of this? Right. If I told you, you could, you can keep yeah. every thousand dollar bill that falls from the front into the room. You can keep, I tell you, I don't think there'd be many people passively hoping one would drift their way. Right. You know, right? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, and, and it's like Proverbs 2, too. It talks about seeking after, um, you know, the knowledge of God like you would for uh, silver or gold or buried treasure, really, is what sure, it is. Yeah, and I mean, if, if I told you, Mark, well, hey, you know, I, we were in a place in the Philippines, uh, an island called Palawan. We have some churches there. And um, on that island, when the Japanese were uh, in the kind of their final stand, the Americans were were in, go, invading. Um, they buried a lot of the treasure they had stolen there, and so throughout the years, there had been so much treasure that was buried there. And and you know, if you knew that on your land there was uh, you know all this gold bullion or treasures or jewels that were buried there, I mean, I don't think you'd spare any expense. I mean, what would you do? Would you say, well, look, I'll get around to this one day, but right now I've just got other things to take care of? No, you would totally shift your priorities. Yeah, and if we could see that the kingdom is of greater value than the things of the world, I mean yeah. that would affect our our uh, our pursuit or our priorities. You know, and that that's that's how I that's why I love the system of the kingdom of God because you know, it is blessed are the pure in heart for they shall see God, oh. and and so God has this divine filtering system. Wow. That keeps people from accidentally getting treasure, because uh, you know if if you don't have a heart truly to to want the right things, the the desire, the ability to see it and That's go for really it good. is not there. It just doesn't materialize in your life, wow. and so uh, the absence of that again requires well seek for that first. I always tell people, listen, if you feel like you don't want God, don't beat yourself up. Ask God for an ability to want him, you know, and then build on that. And uh, because it's, it's, it's all grace, but God has to change, change our hearts, you know. Absolutely. Uh, so, yeah. And, and it yeah. is grace. And, you know, grace is, is God. Uh, I love Philippians 2, 13 in the new living translation. It says, that God is giving us the desire and the power to mm. do what pleases him. Yeah. And he works in us to will and to do his good pleasure. Yeah. And that's grace. That's God working in us. Yeah. But there is, there is a sense, I guess, um, <clears throat> you know, John Wesley called a prevenient grace. And, and that God, it's not like one day we just wake up and we go, Hey, I'm going to start seeking after God. I mean, C.S. Lewis said many years ago that the notion of a man seeking after God is as absurd as a mouse seeking after a cat. Right. And, and, and the truth is that we don't. In Romans 3, which is quoting from the Old Testament, it says, no man seeks after God, but the Son of Man came to seek and to save that which was lost. And so mm. what happens is he begins to awaken in us and he begins to create in us this, this desire, this inward desire in a yearning for for the things of God. And of course, once we experience that, we, we don't want to, we, we won't settle for anything else. We, yeah. we want more. And, and Yeah, and that's a part of the whole journey as well, because there's actually a skill set in stirring up that desire, you know, yeah. that there are things that add to it and there are things that take away from it. And, sure. and uh, again, it's a measure of the relative uh, importance you attach right. to, to that treasure. Yeah, absolutely. And, yeah. you know, where what Jesus said, where your treasure is there, your heart is also yeah. the other way around. But same <laughs> chapter in, in Matthew 6. But the point is what you value, you invest in. Right? Yeah. yeah, yeah. And, and so if we, we value the kingdom, we're going to invest in the kingdom. And, of course, there's always return on our investment, which is sure. <laughs> and that's where that's where I really began at this stage of my life. You know, I was living actually in Vancouver there. Well, Surrey, 
and we couldn't afford a home. We had, we had four kids, then we had five kids. And, and I mean, uh, you know, they were getting older. It was expensive to live there. We were struggling because God wouldn't let me at the time he was training me. He wouldn't let me work. He wouldn't let me plant a church. So I was doing a itinerant ministry and I was teaching at a Bible school, but I mean, you know, it was, it was very thin. I mean, ministry is notorious for not getting a lot of money anyway, but God was teaching me to rely on him. And so um, at the beginning, even before that, this scripture was always there. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and all these things will be added unto you. And the Lord was really saying to me, listen, this if you do this, it's creating the right uh, separation of powers in your heart right now. Because if you do what's important to me, then I will do what's important to you. And that is a manifestation of faith. And so, uh, honestly, I failed many times, you know, getting worried and concerned about money and, and needs when you have five kids living in Vancouver, you know, but but he kept he kept saying to me every time I started complaining, yeah, well, Lord, you know, I mean, I'm getting by, yeah. but you know, everybody else my age, you know, they already have a home, they're paying down their mortgage, they're this and this and this, and and you know, I, things don't seem to be moving along for me. And he would always give me this scripture, and he would say, "Don't worry." He said, "He said, when I set your heart the way it needs to be, all these things will be added to you." Yeah. And uh, and I've seen that in my life. I've seen that you know without an exorbitant income. Uh, we just began to get blessings and breakthroughs financially as as God wrenched from my being the fear of not having enough, uh, which is really a whole other teaching, the love of money. The love of money is the fear of not having enough. And while I would have said, I don't love money, I feared not having enough. And uh, when he showed, it was part of the journey. So, so seeking the kingdom of God is a choice you make. And in doing that, you have to almost ignore what seems patently obvious in a, you know, in a literal sense of, you know, hey, you need to, uh, you need to get your financial house together. But we never lacked, not, not for anything, never missed a rent payment, never, uh, never was in debt. You know, it was, it's a great testimony. My kids grew up with miracles. No, hey, I can relate to that completely. <laughs> I know that story. Been there. You know that story, yeah. yeah. Hey, but one, one of the cool things about seeking first the kingdom of God, of course, is the Bible says that he leads us in paths of righteousness. And we're talking about righteousness. Mm -hmm. So God's right way of, of taking care of us, of governing our lives, of doing things. And, you know, there are times when the Lord... Um, intentionally even though we may not see it is is drying up things in our life because he wants us to move in a new direction sure. and, and what i have found is the key to be able to discern whether you know god is trying to move us in a different direction or put us somewhere else on a new assignment we have to really be able to discern that because there are many times when I'm sure years ago I, I was notorious for this is I'm a self healer, right? I, I want to take care of the, that I'm a problem solver by nature. So I want to come up with a solution. And, and yet the scripture talks about standing still and seeing the salvation of God and hearing from like Jesus did getting yeah. counsel. And, and so I was just thinking in closing here, Mark, um, I'm sure there are people that have been struggling with with seeing the the provision of God's kingdom in different ways. I mean, I'm not meaning materially only, but in different ways. For example, healing. For example, you know, there might be something they're struggling with still in in their inner man, uh, in their soul realm. Um, pray, been praying for prodigals and and not seemingly seeing an answer like god isn't moving he's not doing anything and we've been talking about seeking first the kingdom of god and his righteousness so why don't you just in closing kind of speak into that in terms of um what you would say to someone who who's seemingly not seeing god follow through and make good on his promise in their life and then 
just we'll take a, a few moments and pray. We'll pray for people. And there, there might be um, someone that spe you specifically feel you want to speak into their situation. Yeah. Um, but why don't you just go ahead and, and just share that? And uh, yeah, absolutely. You know, one of the things we, one of the mistakes we are notorious for as people, even prophetic people, sometimes particularly prophetic people, is misunderstanding the time of God, the timings, you know. And so, um, and there's, there's lots of good reasons for that. I, uh, I write about that in a book I wrote called Interpreting the Prophetic. And, uh, and uh, one of the mistakes I made was not realizing God's timeline. Uh -huh. Of course, I always, we know, you know, days as a thousand years, but, you know, we're only going to live 80, 90 right. years, you know. So a thousand years a day doesn't really help me. You know? yes. but, but what I began to realize that, and I, and I knew this, but it had to be worked out in my life. Uh -huh. Is that is that waiting longer is not faith. Faith is more than being willing to wait longer. Faith is a transformation that happens in your heart when you come to the end of yourself and you realize that you have no ability to believe. Yeah. And uh, and so the growth that took place in my life was always on the altar of my own sense of self. I was particularly given to try to please God. And so the thought that I was was not believing him was was hard for me because I, I wanted to please God. And I knew without faith, it's impossible to please him. Right. And so, uh, but I realized that God is in this game. Uh, not, well, it's not a game. It, it is in this work with our lives and he's shaping us. And time is one of the great, tools that he uses to shape our life and i, I want to guarantee you this this is what held me when i began to understand the righteousness of god when i truly truly believed that god is righteous altogether he is righteous there's none like him he is good he is precious that love for his righteousness brought a, a deep conviction right that i I'm wrong if there's any clash between him and I. If I if if I wonder about the efficiency of this program he has me in, if I wonder about the delay, if I wonder why he's not speedily doing what I thought he was going to do, if I wonder whether he was unfaithful, I don't because yeah. the righteousness of God is is a is like a boundary. It keeps me anchored. Yeah. Into who he is, and uh, you know a lot of the a lot of the people I know who everybody gets frustrated, but some people get frustrated at the point where they become disillusioned, bitter, and they leave the faith. Right. You can, you can only do that if you don't understand the righteousness of God. Yeah. You can only do that if you don't if you are not convinced that He is righteous, and so that that righteousness. I, I'm this is what I want to pray right now. God, I pray for everyone listening, for everyone in the moment of frustration, for everyone in the trial of faith, for everyone who is struggling with delayed promises. Father, I pray in Jesus' name that there will be no hardness of heart. There will be no bitterness. There will be no anger. There will be no disillusionment because your mercies will renew in their life every day, every day. God, your voice will set, will renew those mercies and they will come alive with the realization that God is righteous. Lord, I want to say, Father, with faith right now, and I pray that the atmosphere of utter confidence and rest in you would flow through the airways and into the rooms and break the anxiety, break the tension, break the 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 shadow of doubt that would come over the hearts of people in Jesus name. I say, let righteousness of God, let the righteousness, let the revelation of the righteousness of God fall upon your life in Jesus name. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Mark. That was awesome. Listen, everyone. Um, 
there was a lot of powerful truth shared tonight, and I know uh, it blessed you. And uh, Mark's website is on the screen, watchmanchronicle.com. We've had a couple of people inquire about your books, Mark. And so um, I believe we can direct them to your website for that. Is that correct? Uh, no. Okay. <laughs> Send us an email. They're available on Amazon. Okay. Uh, so uh, just Google my name. Yeah. And, uh, yeah. We, we, big story there, but. Okay. All right. So Amazon or send an email to, to Mark. Okay. Yeah, I'm sure you can get the email address from the website. Yep. Great. Okay. And look, everyone, I just want to encourage you guys. We are living in a season and a time when God is moving and there's a lot of work he's doing. You know, Mark, you talked about waiting and, and, um, you know, there's a difference between waiting for God and waiting on God. You know, waiting mm -hmm. on God has to do with ministering and serving and, and just being faithful. Yeah. And, and uh, rather than just sitting there passively and going, oh, where's God? Why isn't he doing it? Doesn't he care? Right. And yeah. so, so the whole idea of waiting on God is so powerful in this season, even with many of us um, in, in, quarantine and lockdown and, and things you know church not gathering the way we used to all of that stuff is challenging us and i really feel personally that the challenge is for us to go deep to seek first the kingdom of god and mm -hmm. you know we need to become self-feeders the church needs to learn how to stand as a disciple of christ every single one of us and move into that place where we know how to seek God's kingdom. We know how to lay hold of the things of God in our own life. And that's something critical. And we can get discouraged. We can get depressed when we're waiting. I get that. But God wants us to break through all of that. Amen. Because the Bible says those that wait on the Lord shall mount up with wings like an eagle, right? They'll, they'll run and not grow weary. They'll walk and they won't faint. So when you're waiting, that's the outcome. You're going to get stronger when you're waiting on God and not waiting for God. So thank yeah. you guys for tuning into this broadcast tonight. We really appreciate um, you doing that wherever you're watching in the world. I see people from, from Africa, from Australia from the United States, from the Philippines, from Canada, from New Zealand. There's, there's people watching from all over. Guys, would you please share this broadcast? Just click the button and share the video. And uh, please leave any comments that you have as well. If you have any comments uh, to encourage Mark, just go ahead and do that. And again, my guest tonight has been um, Mark Griesbois, all the way from Alberta, Canada. And it's been a great time together. Mark is the director of Watchmen on the Wall Ministries. You can learn more. Just go to his website, and which is watchmanchronicle.com. Thank you guys for tuning in. Bless you. Looking forward to seeing you again. By the way, tomorrow morning at 11 a.m. Pacific time, I'm going to be interviewing Becky Fisher. Uh, Becky has developed um, children's ministry curriculum, teaching children how to hear the voice of God, how to heal the sick, how to prophesy. She was featured in the, um, the video. Um, it was actually an Oscar nominated movie about Jesus camp and kids flowing in the gifts of the spirit and powerful, powerful ministry. Tomorrow morning, 11 a.m., I have the privilege of interviewing Becky Fisher next Wednesday night. Another Canadian, Derek Schneider, is going to be with us. Yeah, Derek's going to be talking about transformation. Why uh, is it that in many respects, we people have been praying in Canada for revival, but they we're not seeing revival, even though there's been a lot of prayer go up. Some people would say, well, we need to pray more. Well, my guest, Derek Schneider, next Wednesday at 7 p.m., has something powerful that he wants to share with us regarding the truth of more than, you know, just praying. And, and years ago, I preached a message called coming out of the closet. And what I meant by that was we need to pray, but there's also if prayer is not enough. We need to come out of our prayer closet and we need to do something just like Jesus did as well. So look forward to that. Guys, join us online every Sunday at 1030 a.m. Pacific time at HarvestCityChurch.com. That's HarvestCityChurch.com. 
www.ebenezerchurch.com for our online um, teaching and worship gathering. We'd love for you to join us on that as well. And to every one of you guys, um, part of Harvest City family, thanks for joining in. Let's keep praying. We are reopening uh, and re-entering our, our uh, worship Sunday services uh, on the 14th of June. And uh, keep us in prayer as we do that. We'll be one of the first churches actually in British Columbia to do that. So we're forerunners <laughs> and uh, we're, we're just believing God is gonna use this as an opportunity, but we're gonna keep ministering online. We're gonna keep doing the right things and uh, just keep us in prayer. Any way we can serve you and help you, thank you so much, just let us know. God bless guys, thanks for tuning in. Have a great night. We'll talk to you later in Jesus' name.